after a sip of this. <coughs> Let me summarize briefly what I said yesterday. I always tell my visitors, if you have a question, go back to the basics and you will probably get an answer or better still, the question will dissolve. The basics are amazingly simple. I keep repeating. All there is is the one source. Call it by whatever name you like. Call it the source, call it the nomenon, call it consciousness, call it absolute, call it primal energy, whatever you call it. That is the only reality. <coughs> from this reality, from the nomenon, has emerged the phenomenality or phenomenal manifestation. That is the basic point. From the source has appeared, and whatever has appeared, emerged is an appearance. So what has emerged from this nomenon is phenomenality, is a phenomenal manifestation of which the human being is one object. From the totality of objects, the human being is one object. Basically, essentially, fundamentally, the human being is one object among billions of objects in the phenomenal manifestation. And the phenomenal object that the human being has been described by a writer as a machine, as a human mechanism in which there is a mechanism which prevents the human mechanism from seeing its mechanistic nature. And that is the ego. The ego is the sense of personal doership. The ego is the me as against the you and him and he and she. The ego is that mechanism in the human mechanism which prevents the human mechanism from seeing its mechanistic nature. So if this mechanism is removed or set right, then the, what remains will be self-realization. The realization that the human being is only a machine, a uniquely programmed computer, through which the noumenon or doer thereof. Now, to this ego who thinks he is the doer, I think it is Rumi the Sufi, I'm not prepared to swear, who said, who told this ego, you are made of shit, therefore do not be proud. <laughs> you are made of stardust, therefore be noble. That's what Rumi said. You, meaning of course, the body, mind, organism, the object. The ego, the sense of doership, is made of nothing. It's a purely divine hypnosis or maya. So, I've told you one story about the Sufi story. Let me tell you another one. In the old India, there are plenty of small kingdoms. And in one kingdom at one time, there was some kind of celebration going on. So, everybody was there, everybody who was, anybody was there, allotted his seat. There was only one throne empty for the king to come. In the meantime, the, the chief minister was hovering around impatiently, waiting for the king to arrive. And at that moment, 
ruggedly dressed Supi walks into this place, goes straight to the throne and sits down there to the consternation of everybody, especially the chief minister. Then the chief minister goes to him and he said, what right have you got to sit here? He said, why not? So he said, you're not a minister. I know all the ministers. You're not any official either. I know all the officials. And you're certainly not the chief minister. Each time the Sufi said, I'm not a minister, I'm more than that. I'm not a judge, I'm more than that. I'm not a chief minister, I'm more than that. Then he said, and you certainly are not the king. He said, of course I'm not the king, I'm more than that. Then he said, are you God? So he says, no, I'm not God, I'm more than that. So the chief minister said, more than God, there's nothing. He said, you're quite right, I am that nothing. <laughs> so you can take your choice, made of shit, made of stardust, or you're nothing. So that is the basics. What I refer to as basics, and this is the basic. So the human being, without the ego, is a uniquely programmed computer through which the source brings about whatever is needed according to God's will. So, if nothing is happening, according to my will, the question was yesterday, there were two questions, one was responsibility and the other was choice. Uh, the gentleman is sitting somewhere else, so anyway. His point I think was, I have to make choices in life. If I do not have any free will, if all, everything is done by God or the source, how is it that I still make my choices? I think that was the question. I still haven't made to make the choices. I wasn't sure whether he meant he had to make the choices or he had to make the right choice. Anyway, the beginning is you has, still have to make the choice. That is correct. So, the joke of life is that nothing can happen unless it is the will of God. So, the, the most important basic in phenomenal life, the most important basic concept in life as we know it, after the manifestation has appeared, according to me, is the four words in the Bible. Thy will be done. That is my basic concept. So when I tell people, if you have a question, go back to the basics. This is the basic I'm meaning. Life happens only in the phenomenal manifestation, which is an appearance emerging from the one source of reality. And the human being is one very small part of that phenomenal manifestation. And in the working of the phenomenal manifestation, which is life as we know it, my basic concept is, I repeat, thy will be done. Meaning, nothing can happen unless it is the will of God. So if something has happened, it is obvious that it could not have happened whether it could not have happened whether you wanted it or not. It could not have happened unless it is the will of God. So if something has happened, however important or however unimportant, 
however good or however bad, it could not have happened unless it is the will of God. And it goes without saying that no human being can possibly know the will of God or the basis on which God's will functions. That is for two reasons. One is, who wants to know the will of God? As I said, go back to the basics. Something has happened. How could God have done it? War has happened. Millions of lives are lost. How could God have done it? How could God have done it to his beloved children? That is the point. So, who wants to know why God has done what he has done? Basically, go back to the basics. Who is asking the question? Who wants to know? The one who wants to know is a created object wanting to know the basis on which the will of the subject God or the subject source functions. That is the most important point. A created object can never possibly know the basis on which the creator subject functions. That should be the end of that. But the other important point is the intellect with which this created object wants to know the basis on which the creator subject functions is so limited compared to the intellect of God, the basic intelligence which covers eternity. So, the human intellect always wants a comparison. So, my comparison to this is this. It is easier, it would be easier for a class 2 grade in a school, a 10 year old child, to know and understand the theory of relativity far more easily than a human object could possibly ever understand the will of God. That means, I keep repeating, if a question arises, why has God done this? Why has then God, why has God created a handicapped child? Why had God created a storm or an earthquake? The question will arise because the man intellect, the ego, the intellect will ask the question. But I say go back to the basics and the question has to dissolve when you realize that the one who is asking the question is a created object. That is why the most important basic point that the human being should recollect as often as possible is that he is merely a uniquely programmed instrument or computer through which the source or God brings about such actions as are supposed to happen through that body-mind object at that time and at that place. And there the matter ends. But that doesn't mean that the human being cannot exercise his choice. That does not mean the human being is not supposed to weigh the alternatives present before him at any moment in order to make a decision. That is indeed life as it happens. So the human being has a valid question. If I'm not the doer and everything that has happened is going to happen has already been decided by God, 
then why should I make a choice? My answer is don't make a choice. No one is forcing you to make a choice. But you will force yourself to make a choice because without making the choice you can't go ahead in life. So, the ego comes back to the question, do I have free will? The answer is yes, you have free will. But the ego says, but you have just told me that nothing happens unless it is God's will. That means you are telling me that I have no free will. So, I said there again, the ego or the intellect always wants an answer, yes or no. And whether life can give you an answer, yes or no, I doubt. And I think modern physics has come to that conclusion. That to a question, yes or no, cannot be given. Is the particle a particle or is a particle a wave? The particle sometimes behaves like a wave, sometimes like a particle. So the physicist has come to the conclusion that very often the answer is yes and no. You go out in the shadow, you go out on the sun, there is a shadow. Is there a shadow or is there not a shadow? Of course there is a shadow, you can see it. But you come inside, there is no sun, there is no shadow. So is the shadow there? No, it isn't there. So is the shadow real? Yes, when you go out in the sun. It is not real when you come back into the house. So is there a free will? I say, yes, you have a free will. Because you can make a choice. So the choice that you make is the free will. So does man have free will? I said yes, so long as you have to make a choice, you have free will. But if you investigate what that free will is, on what do you base that choice that you make? It is your choice. But on what do you make that choice? The choice you make depends on the programming in that body-mind organism which you claim is you. Whatever choice you make is based on the information you have collected, your likes and dislikes, genetic likes and dislikes, the conditioning that you have received, it is on that you will make your free choice. So you do have free will, but your free will is based on your programming in that body-mind organism over which you have had no control. So do you have free will? Yes. But that free will is, I think, counterfeit. Because it is not based on something over which you have control. Shadow, yes and no. Free will, yes. But what is the free will based on? Something over which you have no control. Your genes, DNA and the conditioning the body has received. So I compare it usually to something like this. You have inherited an old house. No one has been there for a hundred years. You take the key, you open the house, you look around, you go to the attic, you find a large trunk. You break open the lock and inside what do you find? A bundle of currency notes. Do you have a bundle of currency notes? Yes, you have. You have a bundle of currency notes. Then you take it to the bank the next day and you say, this is counterfeit. 
So you have a currency note, but it's worth nothing. So you have free will, but it's worth nothing. <laughs> but that does not prevent you from making use of that free will such as it is. Therefore, my answer is, although nothing can happen unless it is the will of God, and if something has happened, it could not have happened unless it is the will of God, nothing prevents you from making a choice. Whatever choice you have to make, make your choice. But your own experience tells you, having made the choice, whether that choice works out in, into action and whether that action brings about the result that you have anticipated has never been in your power. Heiner here was telling me yesterday his son had an exam. So his son comes to him and, and confesses that he has not been able to work as hard as he should have. So out of eight subjects, he said, in two, I don't think I'll get through. The results come and he has got, gone through all eight. So the result was not in his control. This is one of the happy things. Sometimes there is the other way around. <laughs> the student works his heart out and the result is not particularly good. My grandson had a similar experience. He appeared for the commerce examination, Bachelor of Commerce. After each paper, he would come and about that time, my wife and I would sit on the in the veranda, not really waiting for him, but that was the time he came in. Every paper he came in, he said, oh, not bad, 70%, 80%. He came back after his accountancy paper. He came with a broad grin. And before we could ask him a question, either by glance or by word, he says, I have not committed a single mistake and accountancy is like mathematics. You get a hundred or you get nothing. Or for bad figuring, you may deduct a mark or two. But he said, I have not committed a single mistake. When the results came, he got only 60%. See? So he was very disappointed. Then there is in, in, in Bombay, a system of revaluation. You are supposed to deposit a, a fair amount. In case the figure is not changed, then you lose that deposit. But if the, if the paper is revalued, you get the money back. So he asked for revaluation. And what had happened was a whole section, of the, the supplement to the main thing, the marks on that were not added. You see? So, on revaluation, he got 96. Instead of 60, he got 96. So, that was the good event. But, in the meantime, the result was already declared that he, was, he had a second class and not a first class. But the revalued marks were added. And, in fact, he got a first class. But on paper, he didn't. Did he have a first class? Yes and no. <laughs> Is there a shadow? Yes and no. Do I have free will? Yes and no. See, that's why I say go back to the basics. And very often, your question will collapse. I'm not saying that the question doesn't arise. Seeing a a handicapped child, seeing a young man killed in an accident, the question arises, 
Why does God have to do it? But if you go back to the basics quickly, the question will collapse quickly until the next question arises. <laughs> because basically the question is asked by a created object. <coughs> now, one question that I had earlier, not earlier, but someone sent me a question. In fact, that was the only question I had last night. And that was, does the sage have desires? So if the sage does not have desires, then he will not be a human being. He will not be a sage. He'll be like a cauliflower. <laughs> Only a cauliflower does not have desires. It doesn't even desire not to be eaten. So, does the sage have desires? Yes. What kind of a sage is he? If he has desires and I have desires, why is he a sage and why am I what I am? The answer is, the sage has desires. That is to say, desires arise in that body-mind organism with which there is identification. But since there is no sense of personal doership in the sage, desires ar arise and may or may not be satisfied. The sage does not pursue them. That is my concept. Desires may or may not arise in a sage, may or may not be fulfilled. But the sage does not pursue them. Now, in the Hindu mythology, there is a sage, a sa well-known sage called Parashar. He is supposed to be crossing a stream. And the stream, which was, there was one boat plying, and there was an old man and his daughter. One of the two would be plying. The daughter was a very pretty young lady. So when Parashar was being taken over to the other school, Parashar saw this lady, he was smitten, De desire arose. And obviously the young lady was willing. So he lived with her. He had a child. She knew he was a, he was a sage, that he couldn't possibly marry her. But she lived with him. They had a child. And when the child was born, the Parashar, sage Parashar told her, I'll come back after 10 years and claim the child. Until then, please bring up the child. Then he asked her for two boons. He had the power to grant boons. So she said the first boon, her virginity had to be restored. That was done. <laughs> the second boon, I forget what it was. I think she wanted to marry a king or something. That was also allowed. And she did marry a king. But the point is, that the son who was born, for whom he, he came ten years later, claimed him and took him to his ashram, where he got training. And he became the sage Vyasa, who wrote the Mahabharata. See, So, when things happen, there are two ways of looking at it. A happens, which leads to B. B leads to C. C leads to D. But the point I'm making is, 
that there is another way of looking at it. If D has to happen according to God's will, C has to happen. And if C has to happen, B has to happen. And if B has to happen, A has to happen. Therefore, A may seem to be a very bad thing. But if that A is supposed to lead to D, which is a very good thing, <laughs> the human intellect cannot know. So in this case, what I'm saying is, the sage Vyas had to be born. Therefore, the genes had to be those of a sage like Parasha. And for that had to happen, the desire had to happen. For the desire to happen, Sage Parasar had at that time to be crossing in a boat, exactly that boat. So, what I'm saying is, cause and effect is not one pointed arrow, it's a two pointed arrow. Cause, cause leads to effect, but for effect to happen, that cause has to be there. So, cause and effect is not one arrow. It, Two arrows. So the sage has desires, or rather, more accurately, desires may arise in a sage. They may get satisfied or not satisfied. The sage really doesn't concern himself. The sage does not pursue a desire. There was a novelist, Razor's Edge. The book, the book was Razor's Edge, Somerset Mom, many years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And the story is that he wrote the book after he had gone and met Ramana Maharshi. The impact of was, was so high that the idea of the book Razor Sage came to him then. And in that book, in the Razor's Edge, there is an incident. The main character of the, of the novel is Larry. He is supposed to be deeply interested in spiritual seeking. He, he comes to India, spends Several years, then he goes back to the States. He goes back to the States and finds that for his purpose, he still wants to read a lot. For his purposes, he decides that being a taxi driver is a good job for him. Plenty of time in which to read. When he works, works he works hard. So he becomes a taxi driver and takes a room from a landlady, a small house, the only room which the landlady can let out. So he lives in that small room, drives the taxi, perfectly happy, contented existence. Then one night, the lady comes into his room, the landlady comes into his room, takes off her clothes and gets into his bed. So Larry, who was reading the book, keeps the book aside and they have sex. After they have had sex, the woman gets up, puts her clothes on and she goes out of the room. And Larry picks up the book and, <laughs> and carries on where he had left. You see? That is another example. The desire arising and getting fulfilled. If the des desire arises, may not get fulfilled. But the sage doesn't pursue it. Whereas the ordinary man does. And therefore, becomes either happy or unhappy. So pursuing a desire is what causes unhappiness. So, any questions so far?
Otherwise, I, I have some deposit. <laughs> <laughs> that is the leftovers from the previous seminar. <laughs> so if you have any questions, ah yes, the other uh, question was about responsibility. That was yesterday, there was another question about responsibility. What I do with my visitors in Bombay, is if a question comes and he or she is not very sure about what the question is, I help him with the wording the question. And I word the question with an extreme. Take an extreme case of what the visitor wanted, wants to take as an example. The responsibility in this case means really if I have not done anything, two, two parts of it, if I have not done anything but the society and the law consider it a crime, why should I be punished? My total understanding is that if the act happened, it happened because it was God's will. It was not my act. Then why should I be punished? The answer is very simple. You didn't do a thing. You are not going to be punished. Some action happened through a body-mind organism. An action happened because it was God's will. The action and the consequences go together. And the consequences need not affect only that body-mind organism through which the action happened. The consequences may affect a whole number of people. So, it was God's will that that action happened through a particular body-mind organism. And it is also God's will that the consequences of that action affect those who will be affected, not just the person to whom it affects. So, if the punishment is there, the, puni the action happening through a particular body-mind organism, the punishment will refer to that body-mind organism again. There is no one truly concerned. Action and the consequences together are God's will. Action and the consequences together is one movement in consciousness which is God's will. That is the point. The other part of responsibility is this. Someone says, if I am not responsible for my action, what is to prevent me from taking a machine gun, going out and killing 20 people? Apparently, a valid question. If I am not to be held responsible for my actions, because all actions are God's actions, what is to prevent me from taking a machine gun, going out and killing 20 people? The answer again is, if such an action is to happen according to God's will, it will happen. And it has happened. It has happened in, in the States, number of occasions. A five-year-old, six-year-old boy takes a pistol or machine from his policeman father, goes and kills so many other pupils in the, in the school. This has happened three or four times. Or another person does the same thing and then shoots himself. So, it has happened because it is God's will. But if you say, what is to prevent me from doing it? My answer is, try it. <laughs> Do you think your programming, fairly normal programming, will ever allow you to do such a thing? It won't. It is only a psychopathic kind of organism 
which is created for such actions to happen, who will be able to do it? And the punishment will also go to the body-mind organism. When Ishaq Rabin was shot in Israel, in spite of the famed Israeli security, which I think received a bad blow after that murder, the young man was asked by a policeman who was interested, not officially, he said, a policeman asked him, why did you kill a good man like that? And the answer came spontaneously from that young lad, 18 or 19. And the answer was supposed to be, as I read it, as it was reported, the young man said, God made me do it. Now, God made me do it could be that the thought came to me should be killed because of various kinds of conditioning. He heard relatives and friends talking about something Ishaq Rabin was doing, which was very bad. So that was conditioning, which led to this man to go and kill him, in spite of the security. So, why was security so lax at that particular incident? Because it was God's will. It was God's will that Ishaq Rabin had to be killed. Therefore, the security was lax, became lax. And this young lad went and killed him. Without any remorse, without any sense of guilt. He truly believed it was the will of God. What happened to that young man, I don't know. It was never reported. And another peculiar thing, tennis match was being played and one time Steffi Graf's opponent, I forget the name, Monica Seles. sorry, Monica Seles. Monica Seles, she was sitting for two minutes rest. And someone from the audience comes and stabs him in the back. Stabs her in the back. Why? Because he didn't want Steffi Graf to lose. <laughs> For the simple reason. <laughs> and the, the real joke is, I'm told, in the court, he was let off. Subsequently, there was an appeal and he was punished. But his the immediate consequence was that she was not to be, he was not to be punished. So he was not punished for whatever, that he did not mean anything or something like that. So what I'm saying is an action happens. What the immediate consequence is going to be and the subsequent consequence, no one can know. My point is no one can know. Only it is God's will. So, if some, in, in the management, I remember reading the other day, many years ago, not the other day, many years ago. If something goes wrong in a, in a multinational company or a big company, the usual way of dealing with it in Europe and America, I'm told, is to find out the cause, who was responsible, and to punish him. That is the usual procedure. In Japan, I'm told, the viewpoint is totally different. Their first thing is to make sure that it does not happen again. What caused that accident or whatever? The idea being to see that this does not happen again. To find out who was responsible and to punish him is, according to the German philo uh, Japanese philosophy, a minor point. They would do it, not that they wouldn't. But the immediate thing is not who did it, but how it happened so that there could be prevention for the next time. So the viewpoint, who did it, who is to be punished, 
is one way. The other is it happened. Let us try and make sure that it does not happen again. That is the other viewpoint. So who did it is really irrelevant. So, any questions? Yes, please. Ah, here. Um, I just wanted to ask a follow-on question there Please. about desire and the sage. Please, yes. And it's got to do with making choices or to do yes. with choices. So yes. if desire arises in the sage and yes. he, the sage doesn't pursue that, so then how the sage makes choices also or has, makes counterfeit choices or, or however you say it. Yes, if he has to do it. A desire comes, there's no need to make a choice. He just waits and see whether it fructifies or not. There is no necessity to take, make a choice. But if a choice has to be made, the sage will make his choice. With the understanding, the sage will make his choice in as responsible a manner as he can. How responsibly he will make his choice will depend on the programming. You see, if a particular body, mind, organism has been programmed to take life easy, don't bother about me, then the choice will be made quite easily. And if the choice is a little difficult, she or she will flip a coin. Decision taken. But if a body, mind, organ is programmed to be a responsible person, then that person will weigh the consequences in great detail, finally come to the conclusion, and the sage, if he happens to be in that responsible position, will do the same thing. If the body, mind, organ is programmed that way, he will weigh the consequences, the alternatives, finally come to a decision and say, this is what should be done, and that is what he will announce. With the understanding, having made the decision as he is supposed to, what finally happens, he knows is not in his control. And if the consequences are that he is sacked from the job, he will accept it. You see? So that if the sage has to make a choice, he will make the choice. How will he make a choice? Depending on the programming. Having made the choice, the sage will accept whatever happens and its consequences will be the will of God. Therefore, if the choice happens to be right and there is award from the society, then the decision of the society to give an award to the sage will be an input in the body-mind organism of the sage. The brain will react to it with a sense of pleasure. A sense of pleasure will arise, exactly as it would in the case of any other person. But along with that sense of pleasure will be the thoroughest possible understanding that it was not his choice. It was not his choice and his action. Therefore, while a sense of pleasure will arise, a sense of pride will not arise. That is the only difference. Sense of pleasure in both. But in the ordinary case, likelihood of a pride, in the sage, pride cannot arise because he knows it is not his action. Sorry, Ramesh, can I just... There's something that just didn't quite get answered Please, there. Please, go so, ahead. Is Please. The, the nature of even coming to a decision in, in the sage is probably brought on by desire. Like, I, I want to do that. So then you make a decision about whether that's a good thing or no, a bad thing. The, the necessity to make a decision it does not dep desi depend on desire. It may be the usual routine for him. If the, if the sage happens to be 
a, an executive in a in a company. That's his job. His job will be to make decisions. So he will continue to make decisions. You see. But if a desire arises, then the one who pursues that desire is the ego with a sense of personal doership. I want it. Therefore, I shall try to get it. You see? But with the understanding that there is no doer and God has already decided when God raised that desire, whether that desire will be fulfilled or not. So the sage, now what I'm saying is, if the desire is fulfilled and there is pleasure, the sage is not going to refuse it. He'll say, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. But if it doesn't, he says, okay. Some other time. Um, may I ask a question? Please. You told me last year. Yes. Because we're talking about desires, you yeah. told me yeah. to leave the will away. I'm sorry? The will, the will, willing, the desire of getting enlightened, to leave it away. The desire to get enlightened? Yes, to leave it away. Will? To let it go. Yes, yes. But I must have also told you that letting it go is not in your control. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I read a book some months ago yes. that people are unhappy because yes. they have desires and intentions and expe expectations. Yes, expectations. Yeah. Not because they have desires, yeah. but because... You see, no one can help the desire arising. Mm -hmm. You see, no one can help a desire arising. But pursuing that desire and being extremely happy if it works out and being extremely miserable if it does not come out, in spite of your efforts, that is pursuing that desire. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I made a meditation. Yes. I sat down and said, no expectations, yes. no intentions, nothing. And what happened was that I dissolved completely. There was nothing left of me, only a sort of energy, a knowing energy, I would say, which was not moving, but it was no color. It was not light, it was just energy knowing energy and after some time I don't know how long it, it, it took um, I, I there was no I anyway quite but, right yes. uh, there there was some sort of movement and concentration of energy and then I was back yes the me was back yeah so during that experience, the me was not there. Yes. That is the point. And what was that? That, if you ask me, I would say, is a free sample from the source. <laughs> supposed to do exactly what a free sample is supposed to do. But Make you want more. <laughs> Well, it was quite nice, yes. Of course it was. <laughs> uh, 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 but I always thought yes. enlightenment has to do with light. <laughs> I had experiences of light. Yeah. Now, because you use the word enlightenment, yes. I use the word understanding. Uh -huh. okay. Self-realization. Yes. Then no light, no darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. 
I have a question about your example uh, regarding someone is running berserk, uh, berserk and is killing yes. 20 people. Today. Yes, that is a psychopathic organism. A psychopath, what is generally you, known as a psychopath. Yes, only a psychopathic is able to do this. That is, that is my concept, yes. My experience as a soldier in the Second uh, World War is that everyone is able to do it. Uh, make an uh, example. Ten uh, soldiers of my unit are killed from partisans. And one of these killed is my best friend. Yes. And when I will run berserk yes. and will destroy the whole village yes. together with others, burning down, killing yes. children's women, Agreed. everyone Agreed. is able, if he comes in a certain situation, yes. that he is running berserk. Yes. Uh, and, and, uh, yes. So, in those circumstances, at that time, at that place, that body-mind algorithm has become a psychopath. Yes. In and that moment. Yes. So. And, and everyone, that's my experience yes. of my life. Can uh, become a psychopathic organism yes. at a particular time. Agreed. Okay. That depends, again, on God's will. Yes. So, if it is God's will that a certain number of people in a certain number of are to be killed. I will come in this situation where I will uh, run in berserk. That is correct. Yes. Okay. So, if a psychopathic organism is necessary at that moment, such a psychopathic organism will be created by God. Yes. In that moment. Yes. I have learned uh, all my life uh, to act responsible. Yes. And in this moment, nothing Agreed. from this old conditioning is Quite there. Right. And I will... Whoa! Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. Everyone, you see now, I'm not better than this psychopathic in the United States. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. Now, you have taken an example of war or something like that. What happens when a man comes back, finds his wife in bed with another person? That moment, <laughs> he turns into a psychopath. <laughs> so he kills. Yes. You see? Now, I'll tell you a joke about this. <laughs> You see, a certain person was in the habit of saying it could have been worse. Anything anybody told him, it could have been worse. Once his friend came and told him, he said, you know, Tom, you know what he did? He said, Tom came back early home yesterday, found our friend Robert in bed with his wife, and he killed both of them. This man said, it could have been worse. <laughs> this man was angry. He said, are you crazy? Tom comes home, a friend of ours, kills another friend and his own wife. Two people dead, one man, a friend, in jail. And you said, it could have been worse? So he said, yes. If it had happened day before, I would have been dead. <laughs> Ramesh, yes. uh, there is something which makes me a little bit crazy. <laughs> when there is no guru and no disciple, then uh, the whole event here, or the satsang, is counterfeit too. I'm sorry? Counterfeit too. A counterfeit guru. <laughs> 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 
No, I repeat. Yeah, please. Please. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, when there is no guru. Yes. And there is no disciple. Yes. Then this event here. Cannot happen. Is counterfeit too. You see, if there is no teacher and no disciple, this yes. satsang cannot happen. It's satsang means getting together a group of disciples and a teacher. So if there is no teacher, no guru, and no disciple, the satsang does not happen. Yes. Or if it happens, it is not a satsang. <laughs> <laughs> it's a meeting. Uh, the whole event is a swindle. The whole event cannot happen. That's my point. A satsang is an event where the teacher and the students, the guru and the disciples meet for whatever purpose. It may be simply singing bhajans, it may be a talk, it may be a discussion, it may be just singing bhajans. That is a satsanga. The meaning of satsanga is, sat is the truth, sangha is association. Association with the truth. That is the literal meaning of satsanga. Association with the truth. And the guru is supposed to represent the truth. So people who come to him call it a satsanga because they are associating with the guru who represents the truth. So if there is no guru and there are no disciples, then the satsang cannot happen. It can be an ordinary meeting, it can be a meeting of painters, it can be a meeting of athletes, it can be a meeting of drug addicts, it can be a meeting of anybody with, with, with the same purpose. This so what is your point? Is there a point? Is the, is the world real? Is the world there real? You see, e mm. even, even, this guru, even this guru and disciple is a concept, my friend. Yes. It is a concept. Yes. So now, the guru and disciple relationship happens extremely rarely. The guru-disciple relationship happens extremely rarely. In the Bhagavad Gita, there is a verse where Lord Krishna says, among thousands of people, there is one spiritual seeker. And among mm. thousands of spiritual seekers, there is hardly one who knows me in principle. That means, who has self-realization. Ich sage es noch mal in Deutsch, vielleicht kann man es übersetzen. And nobody is But who says this event is happening? You do. <laughs> <laughs> the happening of such an event is part of the general appearance, yes, which uh, is an illusion. The ego said this or, or says this. So the, this the ego thinks this is real. And my my point is that uh, it's not necessary as. For enlightenment to be here. Oh, I agree entirely. <laughs> I entirely agree. Couldn't see that you were that. Yes. <laughs> Entirely unnecessary. But Heiner will not give you your money back. <laughs> yes, thank you, that. 
you see, let me put it this way. If, as I told you, cause and effect, we have to go back. If the effect, final effect is for someone to have that realization more accurately, if it is the will of God that enlightenment or understanding should happen at a particular time, in a particular place, in a particular body-mind organism, then that will happen. All the necessary things will have been done. Ich sag, ja, bitte das übersetzen. Ja, ich will sagen, also wenn Erleuchtung passieren soll zu einer bestimmten Zeit an einem bestimmten Ort, dann wird es passieren. Und all das Nötige dazu wird getan sein. Ja, der, das Letzte, oder der, wenn ich das nochmal wieder etwas vertiefe, dann ist bei mir das Gefühl da, dass diese ganze Veranstaltung, ich, ja, ist, ist natürlich das Ego, was spricht, aber ich, das Gefühl ist da, dass das eher ein Hindernis ist, als, als ein, eine Beförderung der ganzen Ver, äh, Sache. Whether it is a hindrance or not, and for those for whom this is a hindrance, will all has already been decided by God. Whether it is a hindrance, and for whom it is a hindrance, it's all been decided by God. Yes, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I asked a question yesterday, and I would like to go on in some specifics. Please, yes, certainly. Uh, now, um, I'm talking about functioning, yeah. right? And I'm talking about programming, mm -hmm. okay? So, and I'm concerned in a certain way for the program, to change the program. And I'm not concerned who is changing the program, all right? Uh, I find a very good example when you told about the killer who killed Rabin, I think it was. Uh, yes. Right? He yes. was so effective, I he, think because he was thinking it was the will of God. Yes. And that make him make his made his act very effective. Yes. And I believe there are people who think, they believe, that they are um, realizing something that is the will of God. And they are quite effective in their doing, in their functioning. So my question is, in the programming, yes. do you think there is a possibility of choosing when you have to choose, in the sense to be more sensitive if the choice that is done, it's the coming from a very, from an ego, illusion, ego root, or if there is a kind of feeling that you are fulfilling the will of God. And this I am concerned only because I am concerned in functioning in a good way. Yes. It's not it's very down to earth. I, I understand, yes. Right. So uh, to uh, synthesize, when I'm acting or choosing, yes. there are moments in which maybe I can say I don't even think about it. Yes. It just happens. Yes. And in that case, yes. the certainty it's, for me, it's obvious that it's something that is beyond my ego. Quite and things are beautiful. They're yeah. flowing. Yeah. Instead, there are other moments when it's clear that it's the ego. is I'm going to do it in my way. Yes. And often, obviously, often, at least in my case, yes. it fails. Yes. So do you think that there is a way of just stopping when there is a choice to be done, to be sensitive, to feel, to understand from where the action is coming from. Let me, put it, let me reword your question. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. I think your question boils down to, I want to do what is right according to God's will. 
but my problem is that I do not know God's will. Yeah, yes, and I'm only concerned for the results. I don't con sincerely. I don't agreed. care God's or not I God's. Agreed. I want good results. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, the question boils down to: I am a good, righteous man. I do not want to do something which will hurt people. I want to do what is right according to God's will. But my problem is that I do not know God's will. Is that not the question? Yes, I'm listening and I'm ready to go on listening. Well, I, is that yes, not yes, the question? Yes, it is, it is, a, it is a different frame. Your, your but own question, yes. have I put, them in the, put it in the right perspective? Uh, is that not really your question? Yeah, my, my question is, I'm concerned in doing the will of God. It's true. That is the real question. Yes, yes. I want to do mm. what is right. Yes. What is right is God's will. Therefore, yes. I want to do what is God's will. Yes, because I'm concerned about the results. Eh? I'm not, uh, <laughs> uh, again. I want to, I'm a good man. I want to do only good things. Right. And good things are according to God's will. Yes. So I want to follow God's will. Yes. But I don't know God's will. Uh, yeah, yeah, now, the question is, may I know it? Can I know when it's God's will or not? But I told you, no one can ever know God's will. But I'll answer your question. It is easy. You want to do God's will, but you do not know what God's will is. What I'm saying, my friend, is you do not need to know God's will. You see what I'm getting at? You do not need to know God's will. Because God already know, has known his will. He has already created his will into practice. And whatever is going to happen according to you by your word, deed has already been done. It's all there. Therefore, I value, I value your problem. It is a very valid problem from a good man. He says, I'm a good man. I'm a, I'm a timid man. I don't want to do anything. I, I'm afraid of doing bad things. I only want to do good things according to God's will. But I don't know God's will. A real problem. Answer to that, believe me, is extraordinarily simple. My answer is, do whatever you think is right in the circumstances without bothering about the results. You, in fact, that is the only thing you can do. Do at any moment precisely what you think you should do or what you would like to do. Why? Because what you think you should do or what you like to do is strictly according to the programming which God has provided. In other words, God knows exactly what you think you should do at any moment. In fact, what you think you should do or what you like to do is exactly what God wants you to think at that moment. Do whatever you like. It cannot go against God's will if it is happening. If it is against God's will, it will not happen. Decide to do whatever you want to do, whatever you like to do, whatever you think you should do. If it happens, it is God's will. If it, had, if it is not God's will, it will not happen. You really honestly don't have any responsibility. Because what you think you should do is exactly what God wants you to think. You see? Whatever you think at any moment is exactly what God wants you to think. So the only way, just the moment that something is happening... Use your, do whatever you think the, you should it's do. It's God's will just because it's happening. So I can only actually uh, remain with what's happening, what you're saying. That's right. Because that's the only thing that I know is God's will. All you can do is decide to do it and try to do whatever you want. 
if it happens, it is God's will. If it does not happen, it was not God's will that it should happen. So whether it happens or not is God's will. And your decision truly has nothing to do with it. Thank you. Ramesh, um, this is a question I've been wanting to ask for some time. You, you speak about God's will. Yes. And let, me, let me interrupt you. I say God's will because for most people, I say God's will, they understand it. I, I'm not saying they understand God's will, but they understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but if you, if you say, many people, several people have told me, Ramesh, you say God's will, and it, it sticks in my throat for this reason. I consider then that it is not my will which prevails, but the will of some other entity, much more powerful, but nonetheless another entity connected with manifestation, whose will prevails over mine. But that obviously not what you mean. No. Therefore, I say, if you don't like the word God's will, I would say according to cosmic law. Whatever happens, happens according to God's will. Or better still, more accurately, whatever happens, happens only according to the cosmic law, which no created object can ever know. Cosmic law. Yes. And, and my question, Ramesh, is that... Yes, <clears throat> please. In, in the way that I understand this, yes. um, there is no you or me that God's will acts on. It's all... There's, there's not even a God that has a will. It's just happening. That is correct. According to cosmic law. That's right. Yeah. But we, I only use the word God's will so that it's easier for an average person to understand that it is not my will which prevails, but God's will. Yeah. But I keep repeating, when I use the word God, I use it as the source mm -hmm. and not as the chief executive officer of this manifestation. Yes, I understand that. And, and what I'm saying is that it, it appears to me that even the concept of will acting on anything is superfluous. Quite right. Therefore, you say, everything has happened according to cosmic law. If we want to use a word, God, then what I would say is, this life as is happening, as has happened, and as will happen for thousands and thousands of years, is a movie which has already been made the script of which has been written by God or the source, it's produced and directed by God or the source. God or the source is playing every character in the movie and it is God or the source who is witnessing the movie through body-mind organisms created for the purpose. It's all there. Yeah. Important thing is God is playing all the characters in the movie. So there is no separation of there any kind. There is truly no separation. Yeah. It's all God, not God's will. No. Yeah. Thank you. Ramesh, you're talking about sources. Are there, is there only one source? Yes. Or are there evil sources too? No, there is only one source if we use the word source. But if you use the word God as only not the source, but the enemy of Satan, that is different. We use the word in different ways. In which case, God represents the good, someone else, equally powerful, perhaps more powerful, represents evil. 
and both have come from the source. The good and the evil, the beautiful and the ugly, are the interconnected opposites forever present in this manifestation and its functioning, which is life as we know it. Life as we know it is based on interconnected opposites, both of which have to be present at any moment. There is never at any time been beauty without ugliness, never been good without evil. And that is what the sage understands. The duality of the functioning of manifestation, the duality of life, the interconnect, the presence of interconnected opposites. The sage does not choose because he accepts duality. The ordinary man does not accept duality. He chooses and discriminates and therefore he lives in dualism, one against the other, beauty against ugliness good against evil, and he therefore becomes unhappy. So the God that I am talking about is not the enemy of Satan. The God that I am talking about is the source, the noumenon, the source, the one without a second, the one from which the second and the millions of objects in the manifestation have appeared. Therefore, the manifestation and its functioning is an appearance. It's a movie. It's so an evil ego. is only in uh, evil is only in dualism. Evil is in duality as the interconnected opposite of good. And my point is, so long as life has existed. The good and the evil have always been present. Sometimes one, sometimes the other. But they have none of, neither of which has been absent. Neither of which can be absent because the whole manifestation and its functioning is based on interconnected opposites. Beginning with Adam and Eve. Have you heard me tell the joke of Adam and Eve? <laughs> I heard so many jokes of you. But Adam and Eve, have you heard the joke? All right, I'll tell you. When God created Eve for Adam, Adam was delighted. So Adam says, Lord, thank you for creating Eve for me. Why have you made her so pretty and so soft and so acceptable? The Lord said, so that my son, you may love her. And why have you made her so kind and considerate and looking after my needs so well, so that, my son, you may love her? But, Lord, why have you made her so stupid? So, she said, so that she may love you. <laughs> and, and we are very grateful that, that he created Eve. Indeed. <laughs> Shall we make that the last question for this morning? Okay. Then we'll have some bhajan. Ramesh, I like to ask the question, um, or I have to say it, it's what is bothering me very much is Please. that I'm realizing yes. Yes. how much I am programming and... Um, how much you are programmed? No, how much I do program and condition my children. Yes, and, yes, um, sure. And, you know, I'm, I'm Certainly. Al always thinking, how can, how can I avoid that? And now I find out I can't. No, you can't. You um, can't. I mean, I have to deal so much with my own programming I and agree. conditioning, and I do the same to my children. Yes, but you have the answer already. Yes, um, it's probably only because it's the will of the source, or oh God. That, so you know, I can't, I can't no. get around it. It is the will of the source that you do whatever you think you should do at the moment. Whatever you do will not be against the interests of the children. Obviously, whatever you want to do, you do in full expectation that it will be in the interests of the children. No doubt about that. 
So, you do whatever you want to do for the benefit of the children. And you are quite right, whatever you do will be conditioning yes. for mm -hmm. the children. Mm -hmm. The necessary conditioning which has to happen from moment to ho moment as far as the children are concerned. Now, how that conditioning affects the children will depend on the destiny of those children or the will of God. Whatever is the will of God for your children is going to happen, irrespective of whatever conditioning you give them. Mm -hmm. But very often it happens that I give them some sort of advice, yeah. and then um, a moment later I think, oh, this is stupid, this is so, so... Um uh, ridiculous. But, yes. you know, I, I know that because of my own uh, experience, Quite right. but still I you very can't. often... You can't help it. No. <laughs> and if it has already happened, it could not have happened unless it was with God's will. Yeah. Therefore, it really is the simplest possible thing. You, you can't imagine the amount of freedom there is to be able to do whatever you like at any moment. Can you imagine anything any kind of freedom, more than that, to be able to do whatever you think you should do without worrying that you may have done something wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic freedom. Yeah. You see, you cannot do anything wrong. There is, there, I promise you, there will be no occasion when you will have to say, I'm sorry, God. There will be no occasion for you to say, I'm sorry to God. You can do it with full confidence. Whatever you want to do, knowing that whether it happens or not, is not your responsibility. It is God's responsibility. You see? So you do whatever you think is good for your children. Thank you. Do whatever you think is good for your children. Not to worry even a moment. Thank you.